for we wrestle, not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Ephesians 6.12 Hello friends, this is Wakeman. Every day, more people are waking up to the deceptions, and gaslight, created by narcissists. Because of that, the enemy's backlash, is more intensive than ever. The first narcissist, Satan, knows his time is up, and that he is already being defeated. However, he and his minions, the narcissists on this planet, are trying to pull as many souls as they can, to their downfall into hell. This video was for people, who were able to understand the scope of narcissism, and its spiritual element, in order to recover from the abuse, and to exit the narcissistic matrix. Things are about to get very intense on this planet, and I pray you get ready, by putting the full armor of God. God bless you. Please, remember. Truth, is freedom. Which focuses on the armor of God. And we're going to cover chapter 6 from verse 10 to the end. And uh, this is our final session in this review of the uh, uh, epistle of the Ephesians. We're going to talk a little bit about our desperate warfare. You and I are engaged, whether we realize it or not, in a desperate warfare. And did you realize that? We need to understand that uh, we are engaged in that warfare. And are we equipped adequately? Are we prepared for what we are actually engaged in? Or are each of us a sitting duck? That's really the issue before us. And uh, so we're going to study the armor of God and Paul's concluding comments on the entire epistle here. The armor of God is Ephesians 6, chapter 10 through 18. And then the concluding remarks are 19 to the end. We'll talk about our predicament. We'll talk about the strategic assessment. What are we facing? And then we're going to go through Paul's armament list. He lists seven things that we have to have put on. Not just one or two, all seven. We need to be girded with truth. He's going to talk about the breastplate of righteousness, the preparation for the gospel, our shield of faith, the helmet of salvation, the sword of the spirit. And most people, when you look these lists up in commentaries, they miss the most important one. That's the list. Not quite. There's a seventh, final one, the heavy artillery that we'll be dealing with. And then, of course, we'll go through Paul's concluding comments for, in the epistle. But the, the underlying reality that we need to come to grips with is that we wrestle not with flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. A very familiar verse to most of us, but let's understand what that's really talking about. We're talking about not flesh and blood. We're talking about ranks of angels here. Those terms in the Greek are ranks of fallen angels, demons, and the like. That's what we're up against. This is serious stuff. So I want to, before we get into the epistle itself, just back up a little bit and re-examine our presumptions about this reality that we find ourselves in. And uh, if I take, put man right in the middle of it, I'll use Da Vinci's Vitruvian man as a symbol here of mankind, us. And let's take things that are smaller than us and bigger than us. Things that are going on the large size, we talk about the cosmos, the heavens, the planets, the universe. As we go and look at largeness, the great discovery of 20th century science is that the universe is finite. It's not infinite. There's a point at which you reach the end of it. It's very big, but it's finite. That's profoundly significant to the field of astronomy and astrophysics and so forth. So it's finite. Key point. Okay, so it's, but we're bounded in our reality on the largest. Let's look the other way and for some other surprises. As we look at smallness, we're now dealing with what mathematicians would call hyperspaces. Spaces of uh, very, very small spaces. So we're going to explore smallness here a little bit, and that leads us into this, uh, to the uh, perception of quantum physics, subatomic particles. And we're going to discover in that world a surprising boundary. 
we discover that the universe is made up of units that are indivisible. There is a limit to smallness. You and I would imagine that things could be infinitely small. No, there's a point at which they can't be smaller than. We'll talk a little bit about that. As just a little uh, thought experiment here, let's imagine the model of the atom. In school, we all uh, were taught that the atom, take the simplest one, uh, the hydrogen atom, there's a nucleus and it's surrounded by an orbiting electron. That's one way of rendering this. The nucleus is in the center, the electron around the outside. Now this is not drawn to scale. The nucleus, we know, is in the neighborhood of 10 to the minus 13 centimeters. That's a very, very, very small uh, dimension. 10 to the minus 13. 10 with point zero 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 thirteen zeros before you get to the 10. And... Uh, the atom itself is larger than that. It's 10 to the minus 8. The point I'm making here is the ratio of the nucleus to the total thing is a ratio of 10 to the fifth, or 100,000 times. In other words, take the nucleus and let that be, say, a, a size of a golf ball. You need 100,000 golf balls in a row to reach to the electron. You get a feeling for the... The size difference here is staggering, 100,000 times, if you will. But that's just linearly. If we do that in two dimensions to get area, like acreage, or three dimensions to get volume, you then have to take the 10 to the fifth, and you need a cubit. That is 10 to the fifth times 10 to the fifth times 10 to the fifth. So the ratio of that nucleus to the total volume of the atom is 10 to the fifth, one part and 10 to the fifth with 15 zeros at it. That again is a number so big you and I can't grasp it. That's the same ratio as one second has to 30 million years. In other words, 10 to the 15th seconds is 30 million years. Do you see the range? I'm trying to get across that this, an atom is mostly empty space by a factor of that ratio, one second to 30 million years. If I say this podium is solid, most of us would agree, but if Gary down here said uh, there's nothing here, he's more correct than we are by a ratio of 30 million years to one second. Do you follow me? So this world we're in, we discover, is mostly empty, and it's really, then why does this podium seem solid? Well, because it's, it, 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 even though it's empty space, you see, it's the, the, the conjecture that it is uh, empty space is more accurate than the idea that it's solid, is what I'm saying, by that same ratio. Now, let me go at it another way. If you take a piece of string, you can cut it in half and throw half of it away. You would think you could do that forever. You could take what you got left, cut it in half, throw the other half away. You would think you could do that Indefinitely, at least in our imagination, it finally gets so small you couldn't handle it comfortably, but conceptually you figure whatever you've got left, you could cut in half and throw half of it away, right? Turns out that's not true. When you get 10 to the minus 33 centimeters, it can't get any smaller than that. If you try to cut that in half, it suddenly is everywhere at the same time. It loses a property called locality. And at the limits... They lose, they lose locality. And that's true not just of length. It's true of mass. It's true of energy. It's true of time. We discover that everything we encounter is made up of indivisible units, things that can't be smaller. It's digital. We live in a digital simulation. And that's a staggering implication. In fact, one of the pioneers of particle physics committed suicide because he couldn't handle the implications of that. There's a plank length, there's a plank length, there's a plank time. There's no period of time shorter than 10 to the minus 43 seconds. It's quantified also. So here's the point I'm trying to get at. The thing we consider reality is bounded. It's not infinitely large. It's not infinitely small. It is a subset of a larger reality in the microcosm and the macrocosm. So you and I are living in what actually is a virtual reality, like a digi it's like a, a, a dig a electronic game. In fact, in Scientific American, in June of 2005, they had an article on this kind of thing, and they pointed out that it appears that our universe is but a shadow of a larger reality. 
That's what the scientists have discovered by their techniques. That's exactly what the Bible has said all along. And uh, it, it turns out that if these the constants of physics they now are discovering are not constant, that implies that the, our, our universe is but a shadow of a larger reality. And that's what the Bible has said in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 3. 1 Corinthians 15 deals with this all through the Scripture. In fact, I'd like to take just one verse from our study of the Ephesians. Remember back in chapter 3, where Paul says that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith, that ye, being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all saints what is that breadth and length and depth and height, and to know the love of Christ which passes knowledge that ye might be filled with all the fullness of God. You may recall that he lists four dimensions, length, breadth, length, depth, and height in the, in, in the Greek. Those are four dimensions. Did, now, was, was Paul equipped to steal in hyperspaces, spaces in more than three? No, but the Holy Spirit guided him here, so we're dealing in a four-dimensional. We know today you and I live in a four-dimensional space. In fact, if, if we, we, uh, uh, the, the most important lecture in mathematics was given in 1854 on June 10th by George Riemann, introduced metric, uh, metric tensors. It took 60 years for that mathematics to bear fruit, and it did, of course, with Einstein's theory of relativity in four-dimensional space-time. And he, Einstein went to his death because he, he couldn't go beyond that. He, he didn't think of making it five dimensions. Kaluza and Klein did in 53, and that re, you know, rendered discoveries in light and supergravity. And finally, Yang Mills in 63 reconciled electromagnetic nuclear forces. So there's now a, a, a unifying concept of all of these. We now realize that we live in probably 10 dimensions. Four of them are directly discernible. Six are cur curled in less than 10 to the minus 33 centimeters. And the current thinking in science from 1984 on is that we live in a 10-dimensional space. And there's a lot of controversies about all of these things. Nachmanides, a Hebrew sage in the 13th century concluded that the universe has ten dimensions. He did that from the study, his study of Genesis chapter 1. Only four of these are knowable, he says. Six are not knowable. That's his vocabulary. Particle physicists in the 20th century discovered that we live in ten dimensions. Four are directly measurable, three spatial ones in time, just as Paul indicated in Ephesians 3.18. Six are, we know are there, we can infer they're there, we can't get them directly. They, uh, they're inferable only by indirect means. So we spent millions of dollars on atomic accelerators to discover what Nachmanides concluded from his study of the Genesis text. But I want to, before we go further in Ephesians, I want to give you another glimpse of this reality we face from the Scripture. In Daniel chapter 10, there's an episode that is very disturbing. We get a glimpse of what I'll call the dark side. Uh, in Daniel chapter 10, verse 1, in the third year of Cyrus, the king of Persia, a thing was revealed unto Daniel, whose name is called Belteshazzar. That was his Babylonian name. And the thing was true, but the time appointed was long, and he withstood the thing and had understanding of the vision. Now, this is uh, in the first year of Cyrus's public career. It's Daniel's third year uh, out of public life. He's in retirement. It's two years after the Jews were allowed to return after the Babylonian captivity. Only about 50,000 took advantage of that freedom. And uh, they'd, be, they'd gone back and started rebuilding the temple. Daniel is still there in Babylon, probably because of his age. And he, he just stayed there. He did not return with the exiles. But anyway, in those days, I, Daniel, was mourning three full weeks. He is fasting and praying for three full weeks. I ate no pleasant bread, neither came flesh into my, or wine in my mouth, neither did I anoint myself at all, till three whole weeks were fulfilled. And in the four and twentieth day... Of the first month, as I was by the side of the great river, which is Hittichel, then I lifted up mine eyes and looked, and behold, a certain man clothed in linen, whose loins were girded with fine gold of Uphaz, his body was also like the barrel, and his face as the appearance of lightning, and his eyes as the lamps of fire, and his arms and his feet like color of two polished brass, and the voice of his words were like the voice of a multitude. And I, Daniel, alone saw the vision. For the men that were with me saw not the vision, but a great quaking fell upon them, so that they fled to hide themselves. Therefore I was left alone, and saw this great vision. And there remained no strength in me, for my comeliness was turned in me into corruption, and I retained no strength. And yet I heard the voice of his words. And when I heard the voice of his words, then was I in a deep sleep, 
on my face, and my face toward the ground. And behold, a hand touched me, which set me upon my knees, and upon the palms of my hands. And he said unto me, O Daniel, a man greatly beloved, and understand the words that I speak unto thee, and stand upright. For unto thee am I now sent. And when he had spoken this word unto me, I stood trembling. Can you imagine? Huh? Then said he unto me, Fear not, Daniel, for from the first day that thou didst set thine heart to understand and to chasten thyself before thy God, thy words were heard, and I am come for thy words. But the prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me one and twenty days. And lo, Michael, one of the chief princes, came to help me, and I remained there with the kings of Persia. Now I am come to make thee understand what shall befall thy people in the latter days, for yet the vision is for many days. Understand what this messenger, this angel apparently, some kind of major messenger, he was dispatched, when Daniel started fasting, he was dispatched to send him a message. But it, it took, tw for 21 days, he is held back by some kind of a creature here called the prince of the kingdom of Persia. But, and, he, and he couldn't get through until Michael is dispatched to help him. And Michael, one of the chief princes, came to help me. And then he said, now I'm come. He's now gotten through. Strange story. You would think angels can do anything. No, apparently there's some combat involved. This angel with a message for Daniel was fighting for 21 days before he had the, the muscle added to get him through. Right? I've come to make thee understand what shall befall thy people in the latter days. This is verse, this is chapter 10 of the book of Daniel. Daniel is a 12 chapter book. Cha the two chapters that follow this chapter are this final climactic vision of Daniel that this guy is giving Daniel. So this chapter 10 is just the preamble. He's fighting through to get the message that will make Cacupi 11 and 12. The prince of the, prince of the kingdom of Persia Apparently behind the Persian Empire, there is a spiritual leader of some kind, called here the prince of the kingdom. We find that uh, in, in uh, speaking of Lucifer, in, uh, in um, both Isaiah 14 and Ezekiel 28, we find these titles being used of personages behind the scenes. Well, this is one of the strange ones here. And for 21 days of our time, this uh, creature prevented the messenger from getting through. But he continues here, And when he had spoken such words unto me, I set my face toward the ground, and I became dumb. And behold, one like the similitude of the sons of men touched my lips. Then I opened my mouth and spake, and said unto him that stood before me, O my Lord, by the vision my sorrows are turned upon me, and I have retained no strength. For how can the servant of this my Lord talk with this my Lord? For as for me, straightway there remained no strength in me, neither is there breath left in me. Then there came again and touched me one like the appearance of a man, and he strengthened me. It goes on. Many scholars believe this may have been an Old Testament appearance of Christ. Others don't think so because he wouldn't have needed Michael to help him. You follow me? So there's some you know, scholastic debate about the details. And he said, O man, greatly beloved, fear not. Peace be unto thee, and be strong. Yea, be strong. And when he had spoken unto me, I was strengthened and said, Let my Lord speak, for thou hast strengthened me. Then said he, Knowest thou wherefore I come unto thee? And now I will return to fight with the prince of Persia. And when I am gone forth, lo, the prince of Grecia shall come. But I will show thee that which is noted in the scripture of truth, for there is none that holdeth with me in these things, but Michael your prince. Michael is the prince of Israel, in effect. Now what this messenger is saying, he's been held for 21 days until Michael helped him get through. I'm come to give you a message. When I'm through with you, I've got to go back and fight this guy again. And then there's going to be another guy, by the, the, the prince of Greece is going to show up. Well, the Greek empire followed the Persian empire 200 years later. So is there a relationship here, apparently? I'm come to thee, and now I will return to fight with the prince of Persia, and when I am gone forth, lo, the prince of Grecia shall come. And all this is a, just a prelude to Daniel 11 and 12. We won't take, I just want to give you that glimpse. There is combat going on behind the geopolitical scenes that we observe. And of course, the ultimate 
combatant is Satan himself. And his origin and his agenda and destiny is something that you need to study. We will summarize it here for our purposes, but you want to understand that background. Uh, he's always addressed indirectly in the scripture. In Genesis 3, God speaks to him. Isaiah 14, he's spoken of as the king of Babylon. And in Matthew 16, even uh, uh, there, he's, he's uh, spoken of indirectly. And uh, he serves as our accuser. In Job chapter 1, Satan has access to heaven to accuse us. He's the tempter. Remember, he tempted the Lord with three major temptations that are recorded in Luke chapter 4. In Revelation 12, there's a summary of the whole drama here. There's a woman with the sun and moon and 12 stars at her feet. That's an idiom of Israel, so, de so declared by Jacob back there in Genesis. And she's with child. This is not the church. Church didn't give birth to Christ. Israel did. And then we have another person that introduced the red dragon. Seven heads, ten horns, seven crowns. And he's identified in verse 9 of chapter 12 as Satan himself. And he's there to devour the man-child that the woman's going to bring forth when born. But the man-child is the one that's going to rule all the nations with a rod of iron. Who's that man-child? Jesus Christ, of course. And he's caught up to God in his throne. And uh, the woman then flees into the wilderness for 1260 days. That's going to be the tribulation that we'll, we, we need to study. Michael and his angels there fight the dragon and his angels. And the dragon's cast to the earth where he persecutes the woman for three and a half years. This whole summary in Revelation 12 is the panorama, the, uh, this cosmic war going on that the major players are, of course, Israel, Satan, and the, the birth and destiny of Jesus Christ as the victor. Now, so the woman is Israel, the red dragon is the serpent, the devil, or Satan, as you want to call it, however you want to call him. The man-child is our kinsman redeemer, Jesus Christ. And so... Now, where is Satan then? God expelled him from heaven, from the mount of God, we just understand from Ezekiel 28. And he was cast from God's government in heaven in Luke 10, but was still allowed access to God to, to accuse us, both in Job 1 and Zechariah 3. In the tribulation, Satan will be cast from heaven and restricted to the earth. It's going to be a terrible, terrible time that's uh, on our horizon. And during the millennium, he's going to be chained and sealed in the bottomless pit, but not forever. He's going to be briefly released at the end of the millennium, and after a brief uh, try, he will be cast to the lake of fire. That's his whole uh, agenda. But the stratagems of Satan, as God reveals his plan for mankind, Satan is allowed to focus his attack. And uh, he starts by corrupting Adam's line in Genesis 6. And it, as, as it becomes clear that it's going to be through Abraham, he's allowed to, he thus can focus on Abraham with the famine in Genesis 50, the destruction of the male line in Exodus 1 uh, under Egypt, Pharaoh's pursuit of Israel even after he released them to go, is all Satan's attempt to wipe out the Jews, thus to wipe out the Messianic line. When God told Abraham that after 400 years his people would come back to this land, that gave Satan 400 years to lay down a minefield, populating them again with the Nephilim and what have you. That's why Joshua was instructed to wipe out every man, woman, child of certain tribes because to, to deal with this contamination of the uh, genealogies. As God p announces he's going to work through David, it allows Satan to focus his attack on the Davidic line. And the attacks all the way, the whole chronicle of the Bible history is Satan's attempt to thwart the plan of God. Joram kills all his brothers but misses one. The Abram slew all but Ahaziah. Athaliah kills all but she misses Joash. And then Hezekiah is assaulted and so forth. You can go through the whole history, historical books of the Bible, and see it's really a drama where Satan is trying to thwart the plan of God. Haman's attempt to wipe out the Jews in the days of Esther is again another chapter in this attempt to, of Satan to wipe out God's program. In the New Testament it continues, Joseph's fear about Mary being pregnant. Herod's attempts by wiping out all the babes in, at Nazareth when he opens up his ministry, they try to throw him off a cliff. During his ministry there are two storms at sea that terrify the local fish, men who knew those waters, who made their living on those waters, were terrified. I'm, I suggest those storms were not normal storms. And of course, the ultimate is the cross. I don't know it's cross. And all this is summarized in Revelation 12, as is just we've skimmed through.
But the main point that I want to make, and the reason we're going through this, is Satan is not finished yet. He's not through with us. We need to understand that. We need to understand his titles. He's the prince of this world. He's the prince of the power of the air. He's the head of the world, rulers of darkness. He's the God of this age. We need to understand that. As we, as we watch the media and the, the whole tide of circumstance shape things that are irrational, we begin to see Satan's hand moving uh, in his domain here. So our present predicament, let's take a look at ourselves in America. We are in moral freefall. We are victims of spiritual warfare. Well, we got financial problems. We got military problems. No, no, those are all derivative of our spiritual bankruptcy. We have the media that's supposed to inform a free people shaping our opinions rather than informing them. They're masking the truth. We've never seen that more evident than in the past year where they, they spent many tries to hide the, the information that we need. We have courts that are perverting justice. There's no longer separation of powers as the Constitution provided. We have schools that are deliberately designed to dumb down our youth. That's the program. That's the plan. Check it out. We have replaced our traditional heritage with multiculturalism, revisionism, and values relativism. They can't find truth because truth is all relative. You have your truth, I have mine. That's denying that truth exists, of course. And one of the tragic byproducts of all this is our what used to be called patriotism is now relegated to a form of idol worship. We worship a myth that was America decades ago, is no longer. Our government is now the purveyor of immorality. That may like sound like a very disturbing conclusion. Why are we surprised? Governments have always in loved crises. They provide the rationale for increased budgets, bureaucracies, and subjugating the population. Governments are the adversary of your liberties. Most new dictators of countries create external crises in order to consolidate their internal powers. In our country, they've long ago learned that social crises serve just as well as military ones. And this, there is one insight that supplies the key missing link here. If, is that immorality creates the social crisis, which gives the government the excuse to grow and, and, and strengthen itself. So why are we surprised that governments now have an enormous incentive to promote immorality? Let me diagram it. Governments love military crisis because it gives them budgets and growth and so forth. But it turns out in our country, social crises work just as well. War on poverty, war on terror, whatever. Now, social crises come about because of immorality. That's what creates HIV. That's what creates the need for abortions and what have you. It's immorality. Is it any surprise that the government has an incentive to create, to promote the immorality that creates the crises to grow the government so that these all grow? And that's what we've been watching in the decades, since about 19, the early 1960s on, you can just see all these things mathematically escalate. So that leads us to this issue of how do we prepare ourselves as we find ourselves in this agony of deceit that we find ourselves in. That's the armor of God. Ephesians 6, verse 10 through 18. Paul he gives us our imperative. He says, finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. I want you to notice that's a command. That's an imperative. It's in the imperative mood. This is not an option. This is a command to you from God. It's in the present tense. That means be continually strong. Not something you do once and, all, once and for all. No, no. It's, it's a continual process. It's a command. It's present tense. Be continually strong. It's in the passive voice, by the way. It's not something you do. It's something that's done to you. It's not your strength. It's God's strength that's imputed to you. So it's the passive voice. In the power of his might. Krate is the word power that overcomes resistance. The same term used in, uh, that empowers Christ's miracles. In the power of his might. Not your might. His might. God's inherent strength is the issue here. That's your imperative, to take advantage of that, to receive that, and rely upon that. 
And then he continues, verse 11, put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. You're in a conflict with Satan. Put on the whole armor of God. Not just a piece or two. There's going to be seven different elements to this. Not just your favorite pieces. The form of the Greek imperative, put on, indicates that the believers are responsible for putting on God's, not their, full armor. You're putting on His armor, not yours, His armor. Panoplion. Be completely armed. That verse is, that's used here in verse 11. It's going to be repeated in verse 13. Be completely armed. If you have a vulnerability, that's where He's going to get you. And you do all this before the battle begins, in theory. But you're already on enemy turf. You're in that engagement whether you realize it or not. That's Paul's burden here. And here's why. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. He's not talking about politicians. They may be included in some sense, but no, he's really addressing the powers behind the things that we encounter. These are ranks of fallen angels and demons. Now, there's a glimpse of this going on in the Bible that is another, I think it's also illustrative. So let me just insert here a review of 2 Kings 6, verse 8 and following. The king of Syria was warring against Israel. Now, he took counsel with his servants, saying, In such and such a place shall be my camp. And the man of God, Elisha, sent unto the king of Israel, saying, Beware that thou pass not in such a place, for thither the Syrians are come down. In other words, the Syrians are planning something, but the prophet of God tips off Israel as to what they're going to do, and thus they avoid disaster. And the king of Israel sent to the place which the man of God told him and warned him of, and saved himself there, not once or twice. In other words, this is a summary of many, many incidents of this kind. In fact, that's the problem. Therefore, the heart of the king of Syria was so troubled for this thing. He called a servant and said to them, Will ye not show me which of us is for the king of Israel? The king of Syria presumes there's a mole on the staff. Someone on the staff is tipping off the Israelis what, what I'm going to do. He is taking for granted there's a security leak among his own leaders here. One of his servants said, None, my lord, O king. But Elisha the prophet that is in Israel telleth the king of Israel the words that thou speakest in thy bedchamber. As I'm fond of pointing out, this is the first recorded case of telephone taps in the Bible. I mean, that's the impression that you get here. See, in other words, what the king of Israel says in his own bedchamber, somehow Elisha knows it. See? So this advisor says, oh, he said, and then the king says, okay, go spy out where he is, that is Elisha is, that I may send and fetch him. And I was told him, well, behold, he's in Dothan. Therefore sent he thither horses and chariots and a great host. And they came by night and compassed the city of Dothan round about. Got the picture? They're not surrounding Israel. They're surrounding Elisha and his servant, this little village. And when the servant of the man of God rose up one morning, he gets up the next morning. That's the servant of the man of God. When the servant of the man of God was risen up that early, he, he, he had gone forth. Behold, a host compassed the city both with horses and chariots. And a servant said unto him, to Elisha, Alas, my master, how shall we do? He's pretty shook up. Wakes up in the morning for breakfast, looks outside, and realizes they're surrounded by the whole Syrian army. What are we going to do? And Elisha answered, Fear not, for they that be with us are more than they that be with them. And I assume the servant says, Yeah, that sounds pretty good, but I hear their engines running, you know. Elisha, and, and so the servant is terrified. Elisha's nonplussed. No problem. And I sort of visualize Elisha at the end of his patience. Elisha prayed and said, Lord, I pray thee, open his eyes that he may see. And the Lord opened the eyes of the young man. And he saw. And behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire round about Elisha. Can you picture that? That's our problem in life. We can't see. We don't see the darkness. We don't see our own resources. Um, I'm always reminded uh, when I think about this, with, uh, when, if you use a computer and use word processors, 
you, 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 on your computer, you can write a letter or an email or whatever, and you can type all this stuff, and, and it comes out, and, and, and you can save the file. So, well, behind the scenes, there's all kinds of things going on you really don't want to be bothered with. How large are the letters? What font are they on? Are they italic or bold? Are they underlined or not? Where are the margins? Where are the tab stops if you indent? There's probably a hundred questions, theoretically, you have to answer before the computer can do that for you. So they adopt some general rules. If you don't tell it differently, it's going to do it this way. If you want to change it, you can, but usually don't want to bother. You follow me? And there are, are and you can, there are con control, there are things you can do to make, a, make the margins wider or smaller, whatever. There are times where you may want to do something a little different with your text, something special. And so there's usually in your software a, a reveal codes key. All the codes that are lying behind your letters are, are, are invisible. You don't want to bother seeing those. But there are times you want to see them, so you push the reveal codes key, and suddenly up comes in all these different colors, where the margins are, where the tab stops are, where the instructions are to change the font from this or that, make it a tab, all that stuff there, uh, which would normally be in your way in your thinking, is there if you need it. And I've often, when, if you've played with a computer that way, I've often thought, you know, that's our problem in life. We need a reveal codes key, a button we could push that would show us, like the young man, the chariots of fire that surround us, that are protecting us from these spooks that are after us, and so on. And uh, this is one of those little glimpses in the scripture that gives us a, a sense that behind what you and I see going on are spiritual forces that are actually determining the, determining the outcome. So, okay, let's continue with uh, Paul's rendering down here. So he's talking, he's getting ready to talk about your armor here. It says, Paul says, verse 13, Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God. There's that same phrase again. The whole armor of God, that ye may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand. The whole armor, not just your favorite pieces. You want to be completely armed is the emphasis here. To withstand or stand up against the evil day. So now Paul is going to go through his list of armor. And uh, his detailed description of this armor most commentators presume he's doing, he's speaking in these terms because he's chained to a guard. A Praetorian guard is chained to him. Do you know why that guard is chained to Paul? So that he can't get away. <laughs> Can you imagine being chained to Paul for a whole shift? That's, that's got to be an experience. And, and that may be, in fact, what's going on here, but I suspect that that... that viewpoint that's widely held, overlook something else. The Holy Spirit is actually using idioms that are from the Old Testament. You'll find these idioms, the breastplate of righteousness and the helmet, all those things you'll find are drawn from Isaiah and other patches in the Old Testament. So it's not just the fact that there happens to be a Roman soldier standing next to him. But let's just go through it here. Stand therefore, having your loins girt about with truth and having on the breastplate of righteousness. Let's take this first one. Paul starts with a guy's belt. And, uh, uh, you know, what, he calls it, you know, be girt about with truth. Remember, what is truth? That was that cynical question that Pilate asked, not really expecting an answer. Truth is our most special treasure to be coveted. Truth is more precious than anything you can imagine if you're concerned with victory or achieving any kind of worthwhile goal. You start with truth. The pursuit of truth is the greatest challenge to each of us and all of us together. And that's what's so tragic about our current culture, which denies the existence of any absolute truth. And that's, of course, a heresy. Now, the Roman belt, by the way, was about six to eight inches wide. All the body armor and weapons were attached to it. In other words, everything somehow, you know, related to that. Well, what do we really mean by truth? I love the definition. I first got it from my wife, um, she, from her reading. It says, truth is when the word and the deed become one. I love that. How descriptive. The ultimate truth, of course, is the fulfillment of God's promises in His Messiah. God promised it in His word, and His word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory. 
It was prophesied of Christ that righteousness would be the girdle of his loins and faithfulness the girdle of his reins. That's in Isaiah 11. There again, truth and righteousness is associated with your belt, your basic, basic item. And then having on the breastplate of righteousness. What do we mean by the breastplate of righteousness and whose righteousness are we talking about? Let me ask you a question. What is your most important stewardship? Your wives will see you and say, oh gee, my most important stewardship is my profession. To be good at my profession. Your wife would nudge you with her elbow and say, no, no, your most important stewardship is your family. That even comes before your profession. You know, you get those discussions. There's something even more important than either one of those. What's your most important stewardship? Let me tell you, it's your heart. You need to guard your priorities with respect to your heart before all things. And the breastplate is what protects your heart, you see. The breastplate, in the Roman breastplate was bronze, backed with leather, and the breastplate secured the vitals. That's why a piercing of the breastplate was usually decisive. Because it covered the heart. And that's, that idiom is used all through Romans 6, 14, Isaiah 59, James 4, elsewhere. A blow through the breastplate was usually decisive or fatal. Okay, let's go on. And your feet shy. And by the way, the breastplate of righteousness, it's his righteousness, not yours, of course. And your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. That's quite a mouthful. And your feet shod with preparation of of the gospel of peace. What on earth is he talking about? Well, shoes and greaves, often of brass and the like, were part of military armor. Why? The use of them was to defend the feet against gall traps, other kinds of obstructions and tied, designed to entangle the feet. If you've ever watched a professional boxer or wrestler or hand-to-hand -hand guy, his, his stance, his footwork is foundational. Just foundational. And uh, the, uh, anyone that's, you know, when at the Naval Academy, you have two years of boxing, two years of wrestling, and then we climax with a hand-to-hand -to, -hand to tie it all together. And uh, one thing you quickly learn, if you're in the ring or anywhere else, is your stance, your footwork is fundamental. And uh, I quickly learned that the hard way at the Naval Academy, let me tell you. And uh, I'll come back to that in a minute here. But So when you're fighting with swords, of course, your first slip is usually your last. So you need to be... Uh, strong on your feet. Preparation is the prerequisite to success in anything you're doing. And here, the whole idea is to do your foundational preparation in understanding the gospel of peace. And uh, that's, that's just fundamental here. And Paul can use, and above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith ye shall be able to quench the fire, all the fiery darts of the wicked. The shield of faith interesting idiom here. A Roman shield was about four feet high and about two and a half feet wide, curved, it overlaid with linen and leather to absorb any fiery arrows and so forth. The integrity of the warrior's shield was essential. And what they would do is between battles, when they're at rest in the barracks, they would examine their shield and they'd plug any holes that were there from the last engagement. The time to plug the holes was before the next battle. Well, you're already in the battle. It's high time for each of us to examine our shield of faith. And if there's a hole in it somewhere, there's some aspect of it that bothers you. There's something in there that needs an answer. Track it down. Get it resolved. You need your shield of faith to be bulletproof because you're going to be engaged. If you're, if you're going to be any you know, relevance at all. And diligence is the key to proper maintenance of everything, but especially our shield. You need to be diligent. You need to deal with it. And take the helmet of salvation. That's an interesting phrase, this helmet of salvation. And then he's going to go on with the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. But let's take this helmet of salvation first. What is the helmet of salvation? That's what protects the head, Right? The helmet provided protection for the head. What is your protection head? Your assurance of your security. It, we uh, strongly urge you to resolve any doubt you have about your eternal security in Christ. The believer knows 
that ultimate victory is certain, is sure, it's determined. The ultimate believer's assurance is a critical blessing. You should have no doubts about that. There are some teachers around that might create a doubt there. You should have no doubt about that. One of your most important aspects of your defense against Satan, its most vicious attacks, is your firm faith in eternal security, sealed and guaranteed by the Holy Spirit. And I urge you to, to, to deal with that aggressively in your study. And uh, a couple quick verses, 2 Timothy 1.12. Nevertheless, I am not ashamed, for I know whom I have believed. And I'm persuaded that he is able to keep that which I've committed unto him against that day. My security is in Christ's hands, not mine. If they're in my hands, I'd screw it up. It's in his hands, it's in the Father's hands, the Holy Spirit's hands. There's a whole study you can get into that. But let's just refresh our memory with Romans 8. Where he, Paul says, what shall we say then to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all. How shall he not with him also freely give us all things? And who shall say, lay anything to the charge of God's elect? It is God that justifieth. Who is he that condemneth? It is Christ that died, yea, rather, that is risen again, who is even at the right hand of God, who also maketh intercession for us. Christ is praying for you right now. Wow. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? As it's written, for thy sake, we are killed all the day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. Nay, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death nor life, nor angels nor principalities nor powers, those are ranks of angels again, remember? Angels nor principalities nor powers, nor things present nor things to come, nor height nor depth nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Whew. Romans 8, from 28 to the end of the chapter. Pick it up. I put a tab in my Bible. Whenever I'm down, I just jump in there. You can't come out feeling anything but fabulous. Take the helmet of salvation. And by the way, you can t just owning it, it's not enough. You've got to wear it. you got to wear it. You can tell the guys that aren't wearing their helmets by the bandages. Right? And the sword of the Spirit... And that's one that we're all familiar with. That's an idiom that's, I'm sure, not unfamiliar to each one of us. The sword of the Spirit, which is an idiom for what? The Word of God. Now, the sword of the Romans was a machaira. It was only 24 inches long. This is very sharp on both sides. This is quite surprising, because the traditional view of swordsmanship is a long sword is better than a short one. The, 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 the standard weapon in their day was a, a slight curved sword that was done by chopping and, and, and the longer the better and so forth. And I can remember when I was having boxing challenges in the academy. I, f I hate boxing, but I have a long reach. And that was, that, that was some help. Still was not my favorite thing, but anyway. Um, but the Romans did something different. Rather than a long sword, they dealt in a short sword that was sharpened on both edges. It was a very, at the time, a very radically different kind of weapon. And with that weapon, they conquered the world. The Roman armies conquered the world. They achieved legendary victories. But there's two things about that short sword you have to understand. It required special training. Just giving you a short sword didn't do it. But if you, with that, you develop techniques to miss the first swing and close in, close quarters, it was a winning strategy. But you had no idea to use it. Special training and lots of practice. And I think that's interesting because that's our jeopardy with our sword of the Spirit. We need to have special training go along with it. We need to understand how to use your Bible. Do you know the verses that give you the entitlement to your victory with Christ? They're not hard to pick a few and understand where they are and what they mean, but it requires some training. And the other question I love to ask a, a group is, could you, as a Christian, lead your Jewish friend to Christ using only the Old Testament? Only his Bible, so to speak? Not hard to do, by the way. In fact, it's overwhelming. That particular approach was recorded seven times in the Scripture,
And every time it was used, it produced enormous results. Throughout the New Testament, seven different people, actually on 11, 12 different occasions, let their friends by the scriptures. And in those days, that was the scriptures, the Old Testament. They, they, they preached Christ from the Old Testament. It's not hard to do. It takes a little bit of an outline, a little bit of understanding, but you can do that. But again, see, it takes special training and practice. You need to sit down with friends and, and exchange on these issues. Practice, practice, practice. Christ implored the sword, employed the, the sword, the sword of the Spirit, three times when tempted by the devil. Each time in Matthew 4 and also Luke 4, where, where the temptation is recorded, each time Christ's response to the temptation was a quote, quote from Scripture. Psalm 119, verse 11 says, Thy word have I hid in my heart, that I might not sin against thee. That's one of the several places where the Bible encourages memorization. Hide his word in your heart, not in your notebook, in your heart. God's word will preserve you from sin. It will mortify and kill those lusts and corruptions that are latent in your life. We all have them. What you deal with them is with the word of God. It all comes down to choices. Is the word more important than what's before you at the moment? Whatever is tempting you, whatever is challenging you, what's more powerful, that or the Word of God? And the answer is very obvious. You just need to take advantage of it. Well, that leaves the last one. We've been through six elements of armor. Most lists, many lists I've seen miss the, the most powerful of them all. They stop at verse 17. They don't go to verse 18. The heavy artillery. Let's take a look at it. It's one of the most important factors in a military engagement is proper ground support, interdiction, Flanking fire, direct assaults, all those things are part of a military engagement. Without that, you're just a loner. This all goes beyond personal armor. Far bigger thing coming up here. We're going to now focus on the heavy artillery, the action at a distance, prayer. One of the most powerful things you do. We sort of take it, it's so, it's so available... It's so easy to get at that we just sort of demean it. We don't give it its place that it should be. Verse 18, praying always, Paul says, with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. Okay? Praying always. As with any supporting fire, coordination is vital. We all need to be supported by prayer warriors, not just personal prayer, indeed. But on top of that, you need to get into prayer war uh, groups to do this. And by the way, the word all appears four times in the Greek. All prayer, all, uh, you know, all perseverance, all supplication for all saints. It's a, con it's, a, it's a collective concept. It's not just an individual. It's not just a loner's craft. And it's to be continual, not sporadic. Just like reliable soldiers, we are to be keep. We, sh we should be. We should are to be keeping diligent, literally in all persistence. It should be habitual, by the way, public and private. Both prayers are encouraged, deliberate and spontaneous. There's time for deliberate prayer. Really set aside. And you sit down. You go through your list with him. There's also time for just spontaneous. You suddenly hear a need. You can pause and send a telegram right now. Supplication, intercession, confession, humiliation, praise, thanksgiving, they all have their role here. But no formulas, no procedures. Just open your heart to the one that's anxious to hear from you. Now, Paul adds a personal prayer here. Paul says, and for me, pray for me in other words, pray and pray for me that utterance may be given unto me, that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel? You've got to be kidding. Paul is asking to be more bold. Most of us would think that Paul is the personification of chutzpah. You know, audacity, whatever. Paul is asking, pray for me that I might be more bold. That may be given unto me, that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel, for which I am an ambassador in bonds. He's writing this from prison. Right? 
And ambassador bonds that therein I may speak boldly as I ought to speak. Paul's asking for prayer. Boy, if he needs prayer, do you think we do? And how? That I may open my mouth boldly. Now this, of course, recalls here the discussion of the mystery of the gospel itself, which is revealed for us in his epistle here, chapters 2 through 3, you may recall. In fact, it was that very reason that he's an ambassador in bonds, as, uh, as expressed all through the scripture. So now we finish this, the, our study of uh, uh, Ephesians with its concluding remarks, verse 19 to 24. Paul says, That ye may also know all my affairs, and how I do, Tychicus, the beloved brother and faithful minister in the Lord, shall make known to you all things. He's the one that penned this for Paul, and he's the one that's hand-delivering it for him. He's standing there with you, uh, waiting for your response, apparently. Whom I have sent unto you for the same purpose, that ye might know our affairs, and that he might comfort your hearts. And by the way, in, back in Colossians 4, 7, Paul calls Tychicus uh, these same titles, and he also added him, called him a fellow bond slave, a syndulos, a fellow bond slave. Peace be to the brethren, and love with faith from God the Father and our Lord Jesus Christ. Grace be with you all, be with all them that love our Lord Jesus Christ in sincerity. Amen. Now there's something about this verse that many people don't know. And I thought I would just highlight an aspect about this that may surprise you. Grace is concluding this letter just as he introduced it back in chapter 1 verse 2. Now by the way, you may recall that Paul had warned the Ephesian elders that false teachers would rise within the flock. That's in Acts chapter 20 when he arranges to meet with them and warns them what's going to happen. There's going to be people rise up from within your own ranks. There's going to be false teachers. Watch for it. And their diligence was commended because when Jesus re writes, re writes the report card in Revelation 2, he commends them that they will not tolerate false teachers. That was the good news. They followed those directions. However, unfortunately, some of those believers lost the fervency of their first love. They got so business so busy on the business of the king that they didn't have time for the king. We should guard against that ourselves. We want to be sound in doctrine, but we don't want to let that get in the way of just devotion, to stay devotional. But that's not why I bring this up, the, the, to the Ephesians written from Rome by Tychicus. Paul puts a personal mark in here. When somebody understands that there were times that there were forgeries of Paul's letters circulated that were a problem. And one of those was following the first letter to Thessalonia. And apparently forgeries of the Thessalonian letters were being circulated, and several passages start to make more sense once you understand that. At the end of that letter, that is the Thessalonian letter, that's the second Thessalonian letter, Paul includes a sort of private mark, a personal token, so they know it's really from him and not one of these forgeries. In 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 17, the salutation of Paul with mine own hand which is the token in every epistle, so I write. Now notice how Paul is emphasizing that he, was, he has signed the letter with his own hand. He, he's using a secretary to do most of it, but he's actually signing it with his own letter, hand, and because uh, it was probably drafted by a professional for him. The token in every epistle. He would also include his private mark at the end so they would know that the letter was really from him. What is Paul's private mark? Let's take a look at Second Thessalonians, how it finishes. The citation of Paul with mine own hand, which is token of every epistle. So I write, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. How many have heard that before? Did you realize that Paul puts that at the end of every one of his letters? In fact, do you realize that no other writer of letters in the New Testament used that closing phrase? It's Paul's distinctive token. It's in Romans 16, Galatians 6, 18, Colossians 4, 18, 1 Timothy 6, and you go right through every one of Paul's letters, it closes with that mark. Even the one that many people surmise isn't really from Paul. And that's Hebrews. The epistle to the Hebrews. Grace be with you all. Amen. Written from Hebrews, Italy. And it's written, handwritten by Timothy, but for Paul. Grace be with you all. That communicates more than most people realize. That proves, it's one of a dozen different details, that the Hebrew, Hebrew epistle of Hebrews was, despite some people's different opinions, it was, I believe, written by Paul. And Because uh, how does it end? Grace be with you all, amen. So why is it so impressive of Paul's style? Because the word grace 
does not even appear in any of the other epistles, believe it or not. There's one exception. Peter uses it in an exhortation, but not as a salutation or as a blessing. But take that one exception. The, the word grace doesn't even appear. It's Paul's distinctive style, which highlights his thing. So there we are. So you and I are in a, we're in a warfare. And we've seen that warfare really come to the front pages over the past year. Alexander Tyler in 1750 pointed out that nations have histories, a life cycle. Dogs, cats, people, birds, they all have life cycles. They have an early stage, a middle stage, an end stage. So do nations. They go from bondage to spiritual faith, from spiritual faith to great courage, from courage to liberty, from liberty to abundance, from abundance to complacency, complacency to apathy, apathy to dependency. And from dependence, back again into bondage. Alexander Tyler, 1750, and there are many other models of a similar type. That was our history. From spiritual faith to courage, courage to liberty, liberty to abundance. That liberty produced an abundance that was the envy of the world. That's the problem. But that abundance soon brought us to being complacent. And that complacency usually deteriorates then to apathy. And I'm fond of pointing out, if you go down the street and ask the average young uh, person, um, what's the biggest problem in America? Is it ignorance or is it apathy? And they'll say, I don't know and I don't care. And that's very, very revealing. But that apathy is going to lead us into dependency. The percentage of our population that's dependent on government handouts is increasing. Politicians have discovered they can buy votes by using your dollars to hand out to others. And that, in, that creates a culture of dependency. And that dependency ultimately leads back to bondage. That's where we're headed. The America that we knew from the several decades ago, 50s, 60s, are, is a myth of, of the past. From the 60s on, there's been a moral decay that is staggering. You can map it with any of 80 different indicators. And uh, it's all coming home to roost with our financial debacle that we're facing and so forth. It took us a long time to dig this hole, and we're still digging it. Life cycle of democracies. And democracy cannot exist as a permanent form of government. It can only exist until the voters discover that they can vote for themselves largesse from the public treasury. When the, con when the Constitutional Convention, you know, adjourned, as Ben Frank was coming out of the hall, a woman apparently asked him, what kind of government did you give us? And Ben Frank was recorded as saying, a republic, if you can keep it. We should not take pride in democracy. Democracy is an unstable form of government. It's this unique balance uh, that make that our government that's given us the, the country we've enjoyed separation of powers due process um, and so forth and uh, we shouldn't we, sh we shouldn't be promoting democracy around the world we should be promoting liberty it's a big difference by the way the average age of the world's greatest civilizations throughout history has been in the neighborhood of about 200 years so we're overdue in a sense but there's only one place that I found that cycle broken, and that's Jonah and Nineveh. Jonah, uh, that was, Nineveh was the pagan capital of the world, and they were declared by God to be 40 days from destruction, 40 days from what I'll call ground zero. And God called Jonah to go give them that message. He was not excited about the assignment, so God explained it to him a little more clearly. He was a patriot. He knew that, that Nineveh and the Assyrians were the enemies of Israel. He didn't want them to repent. He wanted them to be wiped out. But God calls him, and so he, after the fish thing and so forth, he agrees to go. And when he goes there, he doesn't go with a good attitude. He runs through town saying, 40 days and you get yours. He didn't want to John the Baptist repent or else. No, no, no. You, you've had it, guys. In fact, uh, 
And the, there are ten miracles in the book of Jonah. The greatest one is not the fish thing. It's the repentance of the king on down on his own speculation. The king reasoned that, gee, maybe if we repent, God may change his mind. So they did, and God did. In fact, Jonah then spends the next, the last chapter on a hill grumbling because they repented and they were spared. Bad attitude. We have the same situation here. I believe we have a verse that we need to embrace very passionately. God promises in Second Chronicles 7, 40, he announces a principle, and I believe God is immutable. He doesn't change his mind on these things. He says, if my people who are called by my name shall do four things, I'll do three. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven, forgive their sin, and heal their land. Wow. Notice who this is addressed to. It's not addressed to the pagan left in the corridors of power. It's not addressed to the spiritually bankrupt executives that run our entertainment industry. It's addressed to us. If my people who are called by my name shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face. Those are non-trivial things, by the way. Humble themselves and pray and seek my face. Ah, here's the rub. And turn from their wicked ways. This is not a call to the homosexuals. This is not a call to Hollywood. This is not a call to our congress and senators. No, no. It's a call to the body of Christ. They'll turn from their wicked ways. Then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will heal their land. I believe it's the sin within the body of Christ that's standing in the way of what God would prefer to do for America to continue to be a beachhead for the gospel of the hurting world. There are many that would argue that it's too late, we've gone too far, possibly. But I still think we can cling, apply this to ourselves, and uh, so be it. So what's your action plan from all of this? Guard your reactions, be a witness, repair, let's each of us repair our own illiteracy uh, biblically, and our literacy about our adversary, Islam. We need to understand those things, to understand the warfare we're in. We need to realign our own personal priorities in the light of all of these things. And our most precious resource is not our checkbook, it's our time. Where are we spending our time and focus and priorities? And what's your heavy artillery? Prayer. You need to spend time in serious prayer for yourselves, for your families, for those ministries that you cherish. Hold them up in prayer. It's time to get serious about our faith. And of course, as you know, I have this belief that you and I are being clearly plunged into a period of time about which the Bible says more than it does about any other period of time in history, including the time Jesus was walking the shores of Galilee or climbing the mountains of Judea. That's a preposterous statement. I use it frequently, I realize, but I really believe that's true. And it's never more vividly portrayed than the events of the previous recent months and what are going to become clearer and clearer as we go into 2009. And a dear friend of mine who's a devoted Christian, he says, Chuck, we know what's coming and we know what the outcome is. Bring it on! <laughs> so maybe that's our banner for this closing here. Clearly, it's getting close to the big wrap-up. So, Father, bring it on. Help each of us, Father, to be ever more effective for you. Help us to grow in grace and the knowledge of our Lord and Savior. Help us, Father, to be more effective stewards of the opportunities that you're going to be unveiling before us as we commit ourselves into your hands with no reservations whatsoever. In the name of Yeshua, our kinsman redeemer, our coming king. Amen.